Aba mizeto, akwete mayanda, ame ya sanza tina. Akamasi, kwata nitasi, kwata kwema, ukuwa maukwa ishi. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to In the Bush podcast. I would normally say, ooh, that elk just cut me off, dude. I would normally say with my brother Joel, um, but he's not with me here because I am currently sitting at 9,600 feet in the mountains of Colorado, uh, helping my brother, Eric Aragon, fill his elk tag for Colorado. Amen to that. Yeah, man. We're up here in God's country. Um, we just arrived in Colorado yesterday. Um, we drove up from uh, New Mexico, or not yesterday, the day before yesterday. Um, made camp that night. And then uh, yesterday we bombed out into one of my original areas that uh, I cut my teeth elk hunting in. Um, We'll get this part of the story kind of out of the way uh, now, but uh, Eric, welcome. Um, Introduce yourself and maybe tell us about um, your first day in Colorado yesterday. Oh, cool. Well, I'm Eric Aragon. I live down in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Me and Cole met up, uh, what was it, 2021? Yep. Uh, filming Hunt Wars. And, man, dude, we've been attached at the hip ever since. So <laughs> well, I call him my brother from another mother. So he's got the same uh, problem that I have. We're both uh, admitted alcoholics. Thankful there's not a cure. And, uh, man, I'm just happy to be up here in, in Cole's country. <laughs> and it's big so <laughs> it big. oh my goodness but man it's awesome so exciting dude we just you know we're grinders so we just get after it man and yeah every day's a different adventure and you just try not to look ahead and you just take that that day and try to make the best of it and what you can do yeah but that's anyway all, love that's being here with do. my brother and looking forward to the rest of this hunt yeah it's gonna be good yeah we have um We've got a few more days, 12, 13 days, something like that, um, here in Colorado. Uh, you know, yesterday I was just, uh, you know, I wanted everything to happen the way it's happened before. You know, we always have those fantasies of going into your old area and there being elk where you expected them to be, um, you know, before. And, uh, you know, we had this plan and, and stuck to that plan and, after trying to execute the plan there was no elk there (laughs) so um yeah we had to had to do a little changing yesterday um and adjust like always in freaking elk country um you know but we ended up getting into a bull first day here in colorado um you know it was later in the afternoon and dude that was just you know, it's another one of those things like you're expecting, you know, I let out this location bugle and then immediately get this other, this bugle in the hillside nor the wind wanted to work with us at no, all. No, it didn't. Yeah. It was extremely difficult. The, the, probably the thickest elk country I've ever been in. Um, it, it really reminded me of the Oregon coast because it was just every little step you took there was something in your face and something impeding your next step and uh it was just wild um i do want to tell you guys we are out here in in the bush so you will have to deal with some wind noise and stuff we're we're sitting in eric's tent um so just so you know if it's bothersome or whatever maybe this isn't the episode for you but um yeah we're just sharing the hunt um uh but yeah, man, we got into that bull. Um, he was close. We definitely had him very close. Unfortunately, we just couldn't maneuver around like we normally do to be able to adjust for the wind and adjust for the bull's direction. Um, and it was difficult. It was difficult for me to get around you. We were separated by 10 yards at times and couldn't see each other. Like I, I'd, There were times I thought I lost you and then you would move to 
better your situation then i'd be like okay there he is um it was just yeah it was crazy what do you think about it i mean yeah i mean once we once we got we pinpointed where he was my thought you know because we were as, as thick as it was he was sounding off to you yeah but I, my thinking was okay i'm gonna while he's sounding off i'm gonna just have to make a move on this guy and try to sneak in on him but as i was trying to execute that man i'd try to look to my left look to my right right down the center keeping my wind because i knew we had a wind that was kind of pushing to our left i don't want to get too far below him and i need to stay up be on his contour but man the terrain just would not give me uh any opportunity i mean it was you couldn't step on anything it was just i was a crash and burn through there yeah really really hard but i wasn't i wasn't like concerned about that because i think he was thinking i'm an elk i'll start making some cow sounds but my thought was i could probably push to him while you guys were talking i could just keep creeping on him not that necessarily i was going to see him but i i was closing that distance on him because i could hear him he's getting closer but man the wind just probably snapped us right out of there because then yeah next on us yeah next thing you know he's 200 yards away 300 and then his bugle dissipated to a mirror you know yeah. just we could barely hear anything of him yeah. um and p- some of that could have been cows but I, I have no idea so the cool thing was is he did keep bugling so we did uh we decided not to bugle at him again um yeah and, and you know kind of go through the story from there well, yeah, we busted back out, so we kind of went back down the ridge. Busted and... back out is a good way to put it because oh. it was it was like it was so thick. I mean, it was unreal. Yeah, with yeah. just blow down, like miniature blow down. It wasn't like they were blowing down giant trees, but it was miniature blow down with miniature pine trees grown in between every every twenty four to eighteen inches apart from yeah, each other. Yeah, juniper bushes. Just you just couldn't. Like we started bombing back out of there, trying to get out of that mess. Yeah, I was thinking like, well, that wasn't too smart. We probably should have stayed together. And um, there's no way I was going to end, end up trying to move in on him. It's just we needed him to come to us yeah. in that situation, just because. Man, it's just not a good. I mean, I like killing bulls or getting on elk in tight country. That was beyond tight. It was just it was unmanageable, and it's like okay, that nah, was probably not. Yeah, the that's butt. that's like hunting wild pig uh, territory <laughs> that we were in like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we we just we knew we probably not going to go too far, and we were thinking, okay, we had been seeing tracks down in an area, a kind of a there was a wallow there, and a lot of fresh sign and elk urine. You know, he's been peeing everywhere, so we thought if anything, they're going to come head that way towards that spring. Let's just work our way back down that mountain. We'll get the wind uh, in our favor. And, and man, we start moving down there. And then we stop for a second. And you and I were talking. Then I heard him. I heard a, an alarm bark. Well, no, we we had started calf calling. Oh, yeah, that's right. We started calf. You yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, I started correct. calf calling yeah. quite a bit before that. Yeah. Um, it, was pro- it probably only took three or four minutes. And next thing you know, uh, yeah, we moved down off of that bench that was so thick and got down into some of that open ponderosa pine, um, you know, open area to where we could see a little bit of our target coming. Um, and we knew that the elk were somewhere close and we knew we didn't want to bugle at them or cow call. We'd done all that up top. We knew that that scenario was probably going to trigger him to just keep moving away. So I was like, Hey man, the last thing that we can do to try to make this work is let's loss loss calf call this this herd and see if cuz you were like if you get a cow in front of me, she's going down. Yeah, I'll smoke her. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're just we're here to fill a tag, we're here to fill a freezer. Um, it's any any elk that we're legally allowed to kill, that's what's going down. Um, so I was like, let's calf, you know, let's throw the calf in there. We'll get to you know how we know and why we know it works um but dude i started punching that calf call and punching that calf call and punching it and punching it punch 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 and then went silent and uh you know i I thought that the herd had moved off and all of a sudden man out of the blue it i don't dude i don't know that i'm gonna call that an alarm bark because here's the deal yeah it wasn't the volume of an alarm bark. Not even close. And I really think that was a um, that was an immediate 
come here is what it was. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. And you could even hear him sometimes go, boom, boom. Yeah, it's exactly what he was doing the whole boom. time I got up there by him. Yeah. Boom, boom. Yep. Like that. Yeah. It was not an alarm bark because there were so it was so low key that you could tell he wasn't spooked by me. He just didn't know where I was and wanted me to try to come to him. Um, so we heard that. I don't know. What do you think he was? A hundred, hundred and fifty yards from us. Whenever we first heard that, yeah, I'd say less than a hundred. He was right there. So then I, I immediately tried to put put you in between me and the bull, and get the wind somewhat to where he's going to come on our better wind side of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, within seconds of us hearing that, and us and me trying to position. You go bull, bull. And I still tried to move. And as soon as I went to go adjust to make our situation better, um, he was there already on top of us. Yeah, I mean, he, he was, was he was real close. Yep. Yeah, he creeped right up. And then, then he barked. That was a bark. He that barked. was a bark. Yeah. And then I barked, barked back. Right. I think we both did. Yep. We both barked back. Um, because I knew he didn't smell us. I knew he only saw us and you can fool their eyes. Yeah. So I knew that if I just barked immediately to let him know that I was an elk, it would, it would make him question it. And then I fell back even further and started calf calling, calf calling. And this went on for minutes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I look up and I can see antlers coming again and he's recommitted, um, to come into this calf call. And this is, this is after he has – and he's seen me clear as day. Oh, yeah. Like he's seen me just like that bull in New Mexico saw you. Yep. I turned. We locked eyes. I I waited so that he could question it, and but he didn't. He immediately barked, and then I barked back to him, you know. And then anyways, so I've got him recommitted in on this calf call, and he's coming in on a string – um, a little more cautious, and he's constantly, as he's making ground, he's going, boom, 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 just like that. Yep. Not real, not enough to, not enough to clear the mountainside. It's, it's. No, it's very quiet. Yeah, very mm -hmm. quiet. Come here, baby. That, that's kind of what I was mm -hmm. picturing in my mind. Um, I think I'm going to add this into my repertoire of. Whenever I'm doing some calling, I'm, it's not going to be a big alarm bark or something. This is, I, I don't know what to call it, a contact bark. You yeah, know, I don't know what to call that. A it's just a, it come, here, a yeah. come here bark. Yeah. You know, because it was not an alarm bark. Yeah. It was used in a different context by that bull. And it was amazing because I immediately put it into my, I immediately started using it back at him. Yeah. Yeah, I could hear you doing it. I was yeah. because I knew that that wasn't something because he wasn't coming to me and I started using that on top of the calf call and it was really, I don't know if it was confusing him or really making him intrigued in the situation because after seeing a person, <laughs> he came back in to inspect that situation. Yeah, I mean, he got within... I saw the lane he was coming down, and so I positioned myself in front of a kind of a tree where I could I knew I could get him. If I anything, I would probably get a frontal on him. Yeah. Or a real tight cording way where I could put it right in the lungs, you know, and, and run it through him. But um, he, he got to this, like, there was a set of bushes up in front of me about 40 yards, and that's, he was right on the edge of that looking. He's looking He's for it. He's on me. a stop and so, scan. Yeah, and it, yeah, exactly. And when he was yeah. there, this is what I was thinking in my mind for a second. I wish we had that decoy out because mm. he would have seen, that might've been what had got him, but we didn't have it. And I thought, man, that would have been, because yeah. he's looking for a visual the whole time. He for is sure. looking for you. But then I see him and he's, I'm thinking, okay, if he comes down here, I got him here, but I'm hoping he comes to my left because I can actually move up because he, I've got all this brush. He's not going to see me move. Yeah. And I got a perfect, I'll catch him quartering uh, a broadside. And he started that. So then I moved and he was coming. He didn't know I was there. And then he just kind of stopped, and he decided to go back where he was. And but then he, he started because he could see. Yeah, he could, he was losing sight of where he, you were. 
Then, but when he came back around, he didn't commit, so I had to step out. He decided to take off back up. Yeah. And that's when I had to step out, and you barked, and then I barked at him, and I stopped him, and I had him uh, broadside and kind of cording away, but once I drew with him up with the side picture I use, he just wasn't in the – I just didn't feel comfortable. He was spoo. I could tell by his body language. If I let one fly, he yeah. was going to jump that string. He'd been like that bull the other day. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, nope, nope, got to let that go. And then he proceeded back up the mountain. And uh, I thought, okay, give me a second. I turned to look at you. I was kind of waiting, thinking, okay, I hope he knows I'm going after this guy. So, yeah, I could tell. Yeah, so then – once he kind of got up where I could make my move, then I he stayed right up on top, and he, all he did was just pace back and forth, left and right, left, yeah. with that little. He just kept calling you to him, calling you to yeah. him, and I got to a point where I was like, man, I just I can't get any farther on this guy because he's got me. As soon as he, he would see me, just from his vantage point, because he he had the elevation on me. Yeah. But at that point, that's when I started breaking out. I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna introduce a calf to him here, and started calling at him, and he was. He kept that little chirp, but he was looking and looking yeah. and looking for me. But I was Wanted like, man, please come down. Just, I, I need know. you to come 20, 30 yards so I could have a shot. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun on him. And then yeah, uh, and then, cool. and then he moved off. Then yeah. he was gone. He's like, okay, I'm out of here. Yeah, I'm tired of waiting around. Yeah, he got tired of it and knew that it was a deadly situation at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, dude, it's so crazy. What a great learning deal. I've got a new little call that I'm definitely going to try out whenever – um, I can't get an elk to commit to come in just by, th I think just by throwing that little, I'm gonna call it a contact bark out there. there it, it, it's really going to, uh, I think it's going to make a move and really come in and, and commit because, um, it's almost like a bark bugle, but it's not, it's very subtle and not aggressive not because aggressive at all. he came in very close to us. And w what had happened is I had went quiet for so long that he was moving in, moving in, moving in, and then couldn't realize where we were. And then he was just like asking me where I was at. Yeah. That's totally. exactly what that thing was. Yep. Yeah, because there was no smell, there was no sight. He, it was all elk that he was coming into, and he just was asking me to come over to him. Yep. Uh, more than anything. But boy, if I think if we would have just had that decoy, yeah. he would have had that visual. I think that would have, you yeah. know, flicked that ear I'll a little bit. It, I'll carry it with <laughs> us whenever we get head to this next spot. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, day one in Colorado. Um, an opportunity to say the least you drew your bow i, mean, I drew <laughs> i was getting ready to shoot him, it was I... close and i was so proud of that um given that we you know we we were definitely on very fresh elk sign uh, most all the day and then we went and sat on this area that i was wanting to key in on um and you know i don't know if there was a bull there or not we were on the edge of private and it just wasn't uh didn't didn't work out in that spot but it sure did in the the next one where i had i told you that i was like this there's there's a bedding area up there, and I think that's where they're at. Oh, it's yeah, nasty. It was, it was so nasty. I couldn't believe, like, the, to to escape that, dude, they have to plow over so many trees because they're going to be just zigzagging back and forth. And where that elk bed was in there, I was shocked. Yeah. Because if it was a decent-sized bull, his antlers are touching trees while he's laying there in bed. Oh, yeah. They're, I don't even know how he fits in there. Yeah. Because I could, I mean, I'm squeezing. I'm having to crawl. I got my pack on. I'm try, I mean, there was not, I was never setting my foot on solid ground. Yeah. I was on just, <laughs> you know, I was walking on matchsticks the whole way trying yeah. to figure out how I'm going to maneuver through this stuff. And it was, it was kind of annoying. I'm like, God, this is awful. You know, like I'm just getting beat up in here, you know, and I'm. <sighs> You're a lot bigger than I am. I can crawl through some spaces. You know, you're having to kind of make your way. So. I just break through it. Yeah. I just try to crush stuff. And I also try to, um, you know, because we started off that with bugles. And so I was trying to, you know, make it sound like I was uh, the more dominant bull. And maybe that was the the wrong direction to go with it. Uh, because he did he did see, seem kind of timid. Yeah. Well, when, I, uh, we was moving, when we were moving through there, I was seeing, like, fresh sign and track. And I could tell, okay, there's a bull in here. And, and I thought for sure he had cows. Yeah. I was convinced. But after that, I'm like, no, he didn't. Yeah, he definitely had cows, I think. Um, but what was weird is, you know, I don't know if that was the same bull or not, but I damn sure came from the same exact area that he retreated to after that first call yeah. in. 
Um, I was surprised we didn't have any cows show up whenever we did the calf, the lost calf. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that lost calf, dude, when we were in New Mexico, um, it was midday, and I hammered on that thing again. And, I mean, it was a mile and a half or two miles away we got a bugle with that. Sure did. And we closed all the way into what I'm guessing to be 150 to 200 yards away from that bull and sat on him until what we were hoping to be a good win, um, only to have him – now that we know, now we know he was either going to water because we learned by uh, an old timer there that there's some spring, there's a spring there. So he either went to go get water or he winded us and just left the situation. But that calf call made something happen midday to where we would probably just be sitting around up there on top taking a nap, you know, right. eating snacks. And um, it, it got us in the game now twice in less than you know, four or five yep. days. And it works too. I think it works well too. When you, if you blow up a situation, you know, calm it down. Don't, you know, think they're, they're not far. They're yeah. going to run off for a while, but when you kind of let it calm down and maybe move in that direction, you think they're heading to travel. Then you introduce that. They think, Oh, okay, well we left somebody, we left somebody, or, hey, yeah. you know, or somebody from the other group has left. Exactly. Here's exactly. some easy pickings. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it was fun, man. What a blast. Yeah, super cool. So we've got uh, definitely some more days. We'll probably end up doing another one of these podcasts because uh, I want Ben's going to be here this afternoon. Um, we're picking up moving camp already. We've only been here for one day. <laughs> this is the Flatlander style, baby. I mean, this is how we do it. Yeah. You know, yesterday we put on uh, nine and a half or ten miles. Or, that was 11. Oh, 11. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the most we've done. It was the most we've done and in, in twice as rough of country. Yeah, it was rough. Yeah. Um, and some people might not believe that. You know, 11 miles, 11 mountain miles, and I'm talking, we're we're in the base, we're, we're in the, what would you call these, the foothills of a 13er that's right here behind us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's uh, it's nasty country, man, and it's way different than, um, you know, than what, what we were hunting in yeah. New Mexico. So. Oh, for sure. And then I'm used to hunting in the Gila. You I know, mean, I live down in Las Cruces, New Mexico, so Gila's been my spot forever, and yeah, I'm usually up at, you know, 9,200 feet. Well, you're starting at 92 around here, you know, yeah. and then you're really, it's big, big country. I knew we were coming to big country because I'm coming with big Cole Wilkes, and <laughs> he's talked about it so much, and I've looked at it on the map. But once you get your feet on the ground, um, you realize that, man, this is massive country, man. You better be prepared. Yeah. And even when you are prepared, it's so gonna, what it's is prepared? Put a, what is prepared look like to you? Well, for me, it's all you, you've got to be in the best physical shape you possibly can. You've got to put the miles on your feet with your pack, and um, you've got to deal with the reality that it's going to be hard. You're going to be hurting. You know, I'm 57, so um, I don't have the, you know I've got an age coming against me. I hate to admit that because nobody... yeah, but dude, you're in the shape of most of my 40 year old friends. Yeah, but my body reacts. You know, I, I, it reacts differently. Yeah, reacts but you got to know. Recovery, yeah, so yeah. you got to know your pace. You've got to really stay with that. It doesn't matter how fast your guys go in front. You got to work together. But yeah. you've got to control your breathing. You got to and the one of the biggest things up here is you got to make sure. You hydrate. I've been dealing with this uh, Charlie horse in my left leg, which I never have. And I'm drinking a lot of fluid, a lot of sodium, potassium. It's just getting to me for right now. I don't know why, yeah. but we're putting hard miles on. Yeah, they are hard but miles. But if you're, you know, I would say this to somebody wanting to come to hunt this country, you better be training all year. This isn't uh let me get prepared in two to three months. Right. It's not, it's not going to cut it. You've yeah. got to have your, you got to mentally start building this kind of stuff well, up over time. Well, man, in no doubt that mental ability can take you a long way in this country yeah. but man if you're not somewhat physically capable like you're wasting your time and money to come out here and get into these high pressure areas like this yeah like before we even set foot on the trail yesterday morning how many people came down this trail ahead of us four and I get it four and no horses mm -hmm. or four and two horses. Yeah. So four different guys. So two, uh, three different teams of guys went down the same exact trail and horses. We walked past the horses by a mile and we got into elk. How many elk do you think these guys saw yesterday that were in here? None. And, and partly because of 
their ability to not be able to get into where the elk are. Yeah. Because this is one of those high pressure areas that is getting this is OTC Colorado. I know this is ending next year, but don't think y'all that the Colorado is not going to sell the same amount of tag, tags they are right now. The only difference is they're going to get your money up front for uh, the application process. Yes, okay? correct. So th it's still going to be high pressure. And if you don't have that physical ability to either get either one get your camp out there where nobody else is or get yourself out there from the truck and then be able to get yourself back you know that's a daunting task and you know 11 miles is eye awakening to some people and i firmly believe that if we didn't do those those 11 miles we wouldn't have saw that elk no yeah it's not that it's, you know it's to see 11 miles and it's the elevation change that really you've got to manage that you know yeah so Again, it's hydration, it's it's food, you know, you got to eat. And then you got to know too if your body gets tired, take just rest, take a break. Yeah. But you've you know, you got to really be in the game for this. If yeah. not, it's probably not going to be your deal. It's going to break you down really fast. And uh And what's mm. what's crazy is is we did we did um a majority of that hiking um, first thing, and then we did rest a pretty good while. I mean, we were sitting on top of that bull for hours upon hours. Yep. So the 11 miles mostly consist of just getting into where I think elk are going to be yeah. based on where they've been pushed or whatever. Sure. You know, so we covered three miles before we ever really started hunting, mm -hmm. you know, and then we sat for three or four hours. Yeah. And then we then we banged out eight hard. And we banged out eight hard. Yeah, yeah. just nonstop. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, don't just push that aside. You know, make sure that you're able to uh, accommodate the country uh, in the style of hunt that you're wanting to be in. Um, now, if you're a big draw hunter, or if you're on some private land elk hunting or something like that, this is going to look totally different to you. Um, but I, I think the public land game on these high opportunity areas is, I mean, this is what you're, this is what you're doing. I mean, and we're picking up and moving camp today because we believe that we've, we reached out where we could reach today in the area that I know. Um, and then we're headed to a whole nother area and we're looking at a four and a half mile pack in and we're, we're, we're spike camping now. Yep. You know, we're going to be spike camping um, we're going to let Ben get some, uh, some altitude and acclimate <clears throat> and get hydrated and get ready, make sure our packs and everything are ready to go. Um, and then, uh, tomorrow morning, um, you know, we're going to be packing in four and a half miles and setting up a spike camp. And then we're, you know, talk about big country. We're fixing to really be in a big country. Yeah. It's going to be <clears throat> amazing. Can't yeah. Wait. Um, so I can't wait to hear Ben's perspective <laughs> of, you know, uh, and maybe it'd be fun tonight to be able to, uh, I, I need to record a Flatlander Friday episode. It'd be cool to hear what Ben's expectations are before we get out there. And then yeah, after great. the hunt, what, um, what he would, what his, what the reality was and, uh, what he would change different in his planning for his hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's going to be a really cool perspective. Uh, to get from Ben and not just that somebody from you like you you've been elk hunting your whole life yeah I've been at it for a long time you know and this is even uh you know something totally different for you <laughs> oh yes it is <laughs> yeah, yeah so the vastness and the size of these mountains man it's just it's incredible <laughs> to see the views are bomb man but you think at 9,000 feet you're still looking way up there and it's like the country we're looking at you know it's like whoa I just can't wait to get on that yeah but again, that's my mentality is where I have to know that, okay, once I'm on that mountain, I got to stay within myself, yeah. you know, yeah. regardless. You yeah. got to know your limitations. Don't be, don't be afraid to admit it. You got them. I know what my limitations are and yeah. I'll, I'll just deal with it, yeah. but it's not going to keep me off the mountain. And you know? not just limitations physically, but limitations on water intake. Exactly. You know, how much water am I going to be? Because we, I'm sucking my... Now, I, uh, you know, I've done this for so long and I have backpack hunted on the ground hiking for deer and elk, man, you know, months and months at a time, every single year for many, many years. So I know how much water I consume 
And, dude, I'm a four-liter-a-day guy whenever I'm out there hiking. Yeah, well, that's what I've been putting down as four, and it's – it might not even be enough for me. It's probably not. Yeah. And I'm, I am I am regimenting myself to, um, you know, and there's techniques in hiking that I'm doing also with my breathing and stuff and knowing that I know I've got a big hike in front of me to where I've got to pound out three miles of mega uphill. Um, and I know I'm going to be drying my mouth out with breath. So I just try and hump it and get to the top before I get a water break. Um, that's just something that I do to try to conserve and I'm still pounding those four liters, Yeah, you know, so it's, so just be, be prepared and know, like, we're not carrying, we're going as light as we can on these day packs and I'm not carrying an extra filter or anything like that. Like I would normally have if I'm back country, because if I'm back country, dude, that, that water filter stays with me all the time because I try not to limit myself on water intake because i know on a day hike i'm going to be able to make it back to the truck even if i ran out of water at three o'clock i know i'm going to be able to i'm going to be okay until it's eight or nine o'clock that night hopefully i'm not cramping up by then i can get back to the truck then i can drink as much as i want because it's there in the back country there might be times where i might just pull over and we're taking a break and instead of sipping water out of my hydration pack i'm pumping water into my mouth from the creek right there yeah. like i'm just get Literally, water wherever you can yep i'm pounding the water whenever we take a break i try to take a break somewhere back country where i have water right there i'm taking a bath in it i'm rinsing myself off i'm washing my hair you know i'm i'm washing my body and scrubbing down cooling off um and i'm hydrating the as much as i can consume without digging into my hydration pack um so it's it looks different for me back country than, and i might be consuming even even more water uh, than four, but what I'm carrying is four liters out of camp every day, you know, to start with. Um, yeah, so you guys need to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun. All right, let's dig into New Mexico. Oh, I couldn't wait for you to say that. <laughs> um, you're so good, dude, with your memory. I want to fill in on this. Um, and yeah, I want to just start, I'll start off with, I got in there and I got some scouting done. Um, and I got here, I got to New Mexico four days early. Um, I, I bought a little Jeep Liberty. We're going to, we call it the J wagon now. Um, it is the, it's the pimp mobile in the back, in the back countries of, uh, you know, units that you can drive around. Um, I'll say that. It, it failed me on day two. I, I, <laughs> I broke down, snapped a U joint or no, snapped a ball joint off the lower ball joint. Um, I, you know, I may or may not have been driving it a little aggressive. Um, you know, anybody that knows me uh, <laughs> knows, knows that I was probably going faster than I should have been. Um, but anyways, uh, it's fixed. Uh, I spent a whole day of my scouting. Really, it, really, that, that ate up two days of my scouting. Um, but I was able to get it back going. And uh, the country that I did cover, it didn't matter where I went. I found elk and I backed out of areas. And it was just, and, and that reflected in the hunt also. Yeah, for sure. It did. Um, it, it, I, I located a herd here and then i would back i knew it was fresh sign and that's because i'm i'm key up on i'm real keyed up on my tracking and my abilities there to read fresh sign um so i identified that back out of that area immediately go and try to find another herd somewhere else and it paid off i mean 100 percent paid off and not only that what what really helped me a lot is us knowing the unit from the year before and us pounding these areas um, with just a vengeance. I mean, we were putting on 14-mile days several times last year, so I knew the country, and I knew areas to not look, and I knew areas to go look. And, man, when opening day, oh, when opening morning hit, we immediately go in, we park the, we park the J wagon, um, and we drove her in deep, you know, uh, we have a, we had a spike camp spiked out a spike, a truck spike camp right. that we drive the J wagon out of. 
and then get into deep into our area. And what people don't understand is, is you can cover this entire unit by car and be able to cover four miles and hit another road at some way, some direction, no matter where you go. So the deepest, darkest stuff you can get into is only, you know, probably four miles from a road yep. um, is the deepest stuff. But uh, we park the rig and we hike in, I don't know, what do you, mile and a half off of the road. Something and, like that. And get yeah. into our little park, our little meadow area that we had had luck before. And I intentionally, I scouted this area, but only by the road, which, which, that's kind of the way I scouted a bunch of this because when you cut those fresh tracks going from one little circle of road to the next circle of road, you know where and or we know now where those elk are headed and where they're potentially going to be. So we bombed in there opening day, boy. And as soon as we get to our spot to where we're like, okay, it's time to pay attention and get ready and, uh, and you know, figure out what we're going to do for our setup immediately had two bulls sparring less than a hundred yards from us. Yep. Yeah. Um, unfortunately now thinking back, I think we approached the situation a little too close <laughs> when we started our calling sequence. Yeah. Um, I think it spooked the bulls a little bit because we never saw hide nor hair of them, never heard another noise. Um, you know, so, uh, as a learning opportunity now i think maybe we we probably knew the direction they were headed and probably should have moved around and got more in front of them rather than behind them because i think they had already come through that area and knew there was an elk there when they came through there yeah and then we introduced these brand new voices <laughs> 150 yards from them and uh, i think we may have spooked them out yeah but as the day progressed, it just, it got better. Um, we got into another area that, uh, you know, not far from there that we had had luck before. And I mean, we sit down and I do a sequence and immediately have a, ca a cow walk right into our setup. Yeah. She was right on top of us within a minute or two. Yeah. We were calling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and right then I knew, I was like, okay, we're, you know, there's other elk here because there's never just a single lone cow. No. Ever. Um, did another setup, man, and uh, <laughs> freaking had a nice little, I say nice, he was a little raghorn. I don't know if he was a four by five, a four by four, what he was, but um, he came right into our setup also. And I just thought, I thought right off the bat because of where we were in proximity to that cow, because that cow just ended up working off and going right back into that bedding area, back to where she kind of came from. Yeah. Um, so I assumed it was her coming back to check us out, but lo and behold, it was the little freaking bull and, uh, never made a sound, came in silent. I spotted him coming in at probably 50 yards. He came all the way into 35 and, I, I thought it was the cow and you were like, can I move? Because your back was facing him. Yeah. And uh, I was like, yeah, go ahead. You know, no big deal. It's yeah, just and as soon cow. as I turn, there's a bull staring, bull staring me, <laughs> staring me in the eyes. And I'm like, Oh no, there he goes. He ran right out of our life. It was yeah. over. I it, felt bad. I should have just never even asked. I should have nah. just stepped. All I had to do was read your body language and watch you. It wasn't important for me to, I mean, he still could have zipped an arrow right by me. I would have felt all right. I wouldn't nervous For sure. about that. But um barked and you know, he blew up and I barked at him and uh <laughs> cow called and he runs out there. I throw the I throw the decoy up on my bow and he sees the decoy um and he's okay with me being a certain distance from him, but he won't let me get any closer no. than about seventy yards. And I just wasn't comfortable with that. Um you know, barked at him again and, you know, just really got aggressive on him because there, it, in that situation, that was kind of the only thing that we could do to try to, to try to manage anything out of it. Yeah. He, he only saw us, um, just like the bull yesterday. Um, he only saw us and, uh, you can really trick their, 
their vision whenever you say the right things to them and you present those right elk calls those elk sounds it just solidifies that the, you are an elk and it makes them question everything about what they saw yeah because they never smelled us so right he didn't know what the heck until was going on. yeah until they smell you they don't you know you can really keep going yeah yeah um hearing them they don't give a crap dude. <laughs> they really don't give a crap about hearing them seeing you if you bark at them and do the right noise they don't care um the evening time on day one was uh it was crap we didn't have we went um i think we bombed after that we went over to the pond found the bear sign we did some hiking around on that other hillside found there's zero elk sign where we're used to seeing elk um the year before and then um bombed back to the car did just one of those drive over and see kind of things on our way back to camp um went and ripped some bugles nothing hiked up the top of a ridge ripped some bugles nothing um you know, cow call sequence, all that stuff. And, uh, it was just super slow. It, it, it maybe not, it was just void of elk in my opinion. Um, they're just, we were void of elk. Yeah, they I think there, there was, yeah, they just weren't there. Um, because I honestly think that we would have gotten some sort of reaction, either them showing up or, yeah. um, you know, verbally, but, uh, yeah, we're looking for all the sign, looking for fresh rubs tracks things like that there was no good grass there was just nothing you know it, there was water but it wasn't i mean it, it'll hold it would that's just not what they were wanting because they didn't have good feed around that water right so it's like nah, the water the, the cows when we talked about that's like you know we need to find where the cows are we find the cows we're gonna start seeing a lot more bulls yeah but we need to get to a a, a more um watered area because they were getting a lot of precipitation in the area we're hunting but we were separated from like where our where typically we would start out of um to the other areas we hunt you know other country that's a good hour away but over the summertime of driving of driving uh, at driving 30 40 miles yeah so it's a good ways away so but that area just wasn't getting the same amount of moisture so that's right that's when we decided we needed to yeah, we kept our, our truck camp where it was. We just bombed out every day in the J-Wagon. Um, you know, we would put on 30 miles, you know, 30 miles in the morning just bombing, dude. I mean, cruising, drinking coffee, um, you know, just chatting, having a good time. Because um, that's the way this unit is hunted. That's the way you hunt this unit. There is no backcountry opportunity um, because if you do, you're going to have somebody walk in on you from the road. Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I mean, you could on a couple of those little peaks, but it... it I don't think that would be the efficient way to do it because no, these elk all. are so used to people UTV and ATV and, and summer recreation and camping and campers and hikers and all that stuff is going on all summer anyway. And then they're probably getting snowmobile traffic and stuff like that in the wintertime. I mean, they're, they're, they're constantly dealing with people pressure and vehicles and these elk are just adapted to it. And they, they really remind me of whitetail after knowing what we know now right these elk are watching people drive around them and drive right past them and drive wherever and then go hike into deep nasty and the majority of the high concentration of population is right by people's camps right there yep. right there yep and these people think that these elk are coming out of these deep nasty areas to water and get this water and and they're hearing them at night at camps and then they're diving off into these deep locations when really these people don't even know that these elk are bedded up on the hill next to them they're just right there it's yep. crazy so day two day two we bomb up to that yeah that's right we bomb up i got some intel from an outfitter that was bear hunting had a camera on a really nice water pond yeah, actually awesome. um and it had been getting fresh rain and runoff so this pond was um it, to an elk it was neck deep and i know that because i saw the pictures of the bull in the water so i and you know i was intentionally staying out of that area because i don't you know 
I like to find my own stuff. And I like to go into my own areas and in places that I found. And, you know, I kind of would, I felt bad, but I, I knew we wasn't really going to hunt that water hole. We were going to hunt the proximity area and try to find where the animals were that were using that water hole. That's right. So I definitely used his intel to tell me to look on the map and know where those elk were going to be based off of where they were traveling to and from that water. Right. And we did, boy. I mean, we did the whole loop, come up from here, come into the area like this and i mean it worked out immediately we get into some of what i was thinking the bedding area was going to be on that north slope and boom we jump a cow and it just solidified i was like okay yep we're here so then we start slowly picking through the area doing a little bit of calling and stuff like that and then 11 o'clock we hear doug flutie I'm going to call it Doug Flutie because I thought it was a hunter. Yeah, you did. I we really did. did. We both are thinking about that. Yeah. We hear this pitiful little location bugle on the ridge opposite of us. What do you think that was, dude? Half, half a mile? Yeah, probably half a mile. And we knew there was <coughs> hunters in there because we could hear them on their quads. We could. So I thought. At the bottom, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and then I was I, my first thought was, yeah, that's a hunter. Because it, it sounded a lot like that. Kind of whistly a little bit. Just wasn't real good. Tinny. Yeah, real tinny. tinny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what got us going was the fact that when you started calling back, typically, I mean, they're going to start. We we were we, we kept calling but never got a response again. And I'm thinking, now, if it was hunters, because your bugles are really good, they're coming. Thank you. Yeah, they're coming. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, your bugles are great. So that's realistic, man. So. When they st when we weren't getting any responses, then we said, you know what, that's got to be an elk because yep. hunters they're gonna they would at least call back another at least one time Absolutely. or at least they're gonna be moving. We gave it enough time where they would cut the distance and then try to find us. Yeah, right? and there was enough country there in between us that they could have come to us a long ways before dropping into that canyon. <laughs> yeah, because dropping down it was a little nasty. It was a little nasty. I mean, yeah. it was nasty, dude. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we so immediately we're deciding okay are we going to hike all the way around this nasty slot canyon <laughs> or are we going to call it and jump off the cliff and go dive through this freaking canyon and we um we cut across the canyon dude and it, it was i think it was the right move because that's movie we made that day we cut i mean we cut three quarters of the distance to that bull in 15 minutes when it was going to take us an hour yeah. or more to, to you know to traverse around that slot canyon um, but we navigated it and we did it safely. Um, and it worked out perfect, man. And, uh, immediately coming up that other side, I could tell, I was like, okay, dude, we're getting into some fresh elk sign. Yeah. Cause there's, there's just, there was old bull rubs and stuff everywhere. And, uh, you could just tell we were getting into one of those areas that it was just a bench or two away and yep. we were going to be into elk. Yeah. It was a good transition area. Yeah. Where they could move, you know, from that higher country and get into different ridge lines and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um, so maybe you take it away from here. Well, dude. from here, you bust out that sequence that you like using, you know, with, yeah. with, with, with your external call. I do. I love that it external sounds, call. Yeah, it's real nasally. It sounds it's awesome. It's very, it, to me, that sounds like a matriarch cow. Yeah that very uh mature. yes very mature cow so i introduce a young cow calf you know maybe a yearling um and then that um that cow and then i just let out a pitiful little you know just i'm feeling my oats bugle yeah, is like what it. i like to call it yep. yeah and boy does it get a response dude totally gets it in here so he you let that fly and i mean god I don't even know. It was like almost immediate. Here they come. Cows. Cows coming right. And they just, they busted our movement. Two cows in a cat. No, they no, came it was in. The, it was the wind. The wind switched. got us. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Wind yeah. switches on us and they, they tail off. But again, we started talking there like, let's just hang out right here. for. Well, I barked at them. Yeah. He barked at them. Been in, uh, barked at them and then let it be. Yeah. Um. We talked about the situation. We just kind of sat there and said, hey. Let's just chill. Let's just chill for a minute. Let's see what else starts to play out. 
Dude, I wouldn't. A couple minutes, maybe. If that. The next yeah. thing I hear you say is, "Bull's coming to my left or to my right." Yeah, I was like, "Bull, right here." Yeah, get behind me. So I start backing off the mountain, trying to get down. I could see where I've got a little bit of a contour where I could drop down. And once I, so I got away from you, could see that he was coming. So you were that, you were only twenty yards from me. Yeah, about twenty five. Yeah, yeah, I was wasn't far at all. Yeah. But then I just proceeded to use just you know, just real soft cow calls. Yeah. Um, nothing fancy. I just wanted to see if I, I, I could I had eyes on him so I could see whether he was uh, responding to it. I, and I didn't start off, you know, like trying to regather him or nothing. Just very faint, but behind me, not towards you. I wanted him to think I was farther back. And man, he was coming. Yeah. He was he was on his way. Yeah, so. and there wasn't nothing. It, that was kind of one of those oh shit moments where the bull was almost already in shooting range when I spotted him. Um, yeah, but I wanted I wanted a better I wanted a better you know shot than that. Um, and I mean, dude, you pop him with a couple of those sexy little cow calls. I mean, just the. You were using the Elk Bros call, the oh, sugar. I was using the sugar, man. If you guys haven't tried that yeah. call, get on it because it's it's from Wapiti River. Yep. And man, go that to elk, elkbros.com. Elk yeah. yeah. Nice plug for that, but really, it's a it's a sweet little a, call. Yeah, you don't blow on it hard, man. You just it's really very a, subtle. Yeah, very subtle, but man, it's it was it's primo, sweet. and it was so sweet that whenever he heard that he immediately mewed to you you couldn't hear it because it was so little yeah. he was just like Bing. you know and it was just the you it, for somebody that if i was to record it you would have thought it was a cow yeah for real um and here he comes man he comes right in and i knew he was under 30 and in between 20 and 30 um and when he was coming in, I knew it was going to be close because he was already, when he committed, he was at 50 yards, you know. And so I dialed my pin and I, I rolled it up to 30 real quick. I just rolled it as fast as I could and it like lost traction and stopped at 30 and I had to get back into my D loop. So I looped in knowing I was at 30 and um, man, he came in and as he was coming in, I knew I was going to have to draw because it was going to be one of those situations where he was going to be too close. So I, I drew thinking I was going to stop him in a frontal. Well, when he caught my draw, I was already to the end of my draw and he could, he had already taken a couple more steps. And then guess what? Guess where he stopped was right behind. He had a stump right behind yeah, his up. kill zone. And uh, that burned up stump, I mean, dead on where I wanted to put my, I mean, I had my pins on that stump. That was, that was the only shot I had. So I had to let him keep coming. And the wind was questionable because we were sitting in a little bowl right there. And uh, you could you could see all this going down. But from your perspective, I, I should have had a shot. Um, it probably looked like you probably could have shot him. Either. Yeah, I did. It looked like that. And I was, I wanted to keep him coming, but. I had visual on you. I saw you draw. So when I saw you draw, I thought, okay, he's, you know, mature enough hunter to stop him himself. I was afraid if I, like, I think I was thinking to myself, like, okay, he's got the angle. He's just waiting for him just to take a couple steps. And he's going to hit him. Yeah. Do I call at him? Because if not, I was thinking I wanted him. Even I said, I'm going to walk. He'll, I'll walk him right by him. Right. But I'm like, nah, he's mature enough hunter. He knows. I, I don't want to mess that up. I didn't have to, like, move him to the left or to the right. Yeah. He was right there, so I, I just had to be quiet and just let it play out. I thought, but I thought for sure I was thinking, man, he's gonna he's gonna walk right on top of you. Yeah, but and I mean, he he almost was, man. So I was <laughs> at full draw for a pretty good while there. I don't know what the time was, but he, he was sitting there, you know, just kind of questioning and um, because you were close enough to where he should have seen, seen a, he right. should have seen a cow. Yep. Um, so he was a little hesitant, um, but and then. And then he tosses that nose up a little bit, dude, and you can just see it. I, can, you know, I've seen that body language. And he takes another step, and he takes a step to the left, and he opens up that freaking that shoulder that's facing me. And in between him, I knew he was leaving the country. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, he's at twenty. 
you've got your 30 pin right now hold low a little and i think mid shot i just keep drifting low yeah. after the situation you know after being able to think about this and y'all i i punch it and i rip him right through the freaking brisket and immediately running off like i can see it it's an inch or two what i can tell to be above his brisket yeah on on the exit side yep and you know knowing that the angle that he was at and then even seeing the shot off of that bull we recovered with uh, zuni mountain outfitters the other day yeah i saw his shot and i knew i was like i was way too low yeah so we doing the right thing i mean immediately i knew it was low and i even told you i said man the shot is way low yep way low but d respect out of the animal and knowing like it's my duty to try to do what i can to recover this thing we sit down there for two hours you know hoping that maybe there's something that uh you know that i got something good and um you know we just we sit there and the whole time you know i'm i'm i know deep down it was just not a good not a good shot and dude to have that go down at such a short distance like that you know i can brag all day about shooting at 100 yards but when you can't execute at 30 yards and part of it was you know him blowing out of there i i hope and you know not as much my fault as it was the combination of him getting ready to leave and you know i'm think i i think about him pivoting on his back legs and raising his front end up like that when he went to turn and it just complicated it just it exasperated that whole low hold low because my pin is aiming higher um yeah it just uh once we took up the blood trail immediately that first drop of blood i was like i've seen this before. but when you found your arrow Oh, you, you knew I, right away. I, I glass, you could see it with your binoculars. Yep, like, I, I glassed my shot. arrow, and I told you immediately. I said, "It ain't good, bro. Yeah, it ain't good." And I said, "I could see little bits of meat on it, and it's just got that fatty haze on it. You know that that that. It's hard to describe. You know, whenever you hit that fat and that meat and muscle, I guess the best way that I can describe it is whenever you double lung and you shoot a heart." heart shot or double lung it cleans that arrow with blood yeah if that's a good it way to put it it, it saturates yeah. it and there was no saturation on the, there was no blood at all it was all little bitty fag, fa, uh, fragment fragments sorry yeah. of meat and fat so that's one, and then I smell it. There's no punch smell. It doesn't even smell like blood. It smells like a good elk steak is what it smelled like. Yep. Um, so then, um, you know, that's just solidifying my low shot. And then we take up blood, and it's just that drop here, drop there. He stood here for a couple of minutes, drop, 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 you know, l less drops, less drops, stand look back and the timing of it where those stand marks were reflected the way we called at him as he was walking away because i could see him walking away and pausing in those spots and then after that it was the full disappear of not only him but the blood trail uh his direction of travel i mean we gritted through that that area right there trying to pick up more uh blood and sign and then after that we just stayed on the trajectory of that bull and in the area that we were in we could glass 200 yards to the left 200 yards to the right yeah you know so we were covering a swath of of a bunch of country you know and uh and unfortunately uh you know our efforts were were none you know yeah and he coagulated up you could tell that last spot where we saw the blood I, I kind of figured like, oh yeah, he's already coag he's coagulated. It's not in a because you punch right through him. We should have if you would have hit him anywhere in a vital, we would have had a great blood trail. Yeah. Just no, nah, he coagulated up 
because you just hit him right in the muscle. You just punched yeah. him low. The only thing he's gonna he's gonna have a hard time jumping up on a cow to try to breed. <laughs> ain't gonna feel too good. So he might be out of the he might be out of the race this year for that. Yeah, but. his brisket is definitely hurting. Yeah. Um, you know, and dang, dude, I so hate doing that. And I, you know, I just went on the beat up. You know, beat myself up train after that. Um, you know, but good thing is is you know having a good hunt a hunting partner and you being like man that's hunting and um yeah the rest of that afternoon was yeah. uh was you know and you make a good point though it's like when i was telling you hey, you know it's hunting i didn't mean it like okay we just got we're reckless no I, I could watch it all go down and say okay no you took an ethical shot i mean that animal moves a little bit it's i mean just that's hunting you but you took the best possible shot you could yeah. you just hit him low yeah but you hit him in a spot where it's not life-threatening yeah so we i could confidently say no that bull's gonna live he's just gonna man they're just so tough he didn't have an arrow it's gonna be sticking in him uh, we waited the time that we needed to wait you know it was just okay now we got to mentally kind of move on we've done everything we can to, yeah now the hunt continues yeah and yeah it does I, I you know it's the worst feeling in the world it, it but it's worse when because i've done it where i shouldn't have taken a shot yeah and then you go man that was stupid on my yeah. part why did i you know i was young why did i, I definitely didn't that? feel like it was stupid no, i just feel like there could have been a little better judgment on my call and maybe it was stupid because I didn't fully let that bull stop. I knew he was moving away, but because of him rotating on that axis, yeah. I just assumed that, dude, I was going to punch it right through heart, lung, and then stick in that offside yeah. shoulder when really, you know, when I executed my shot, my 30-yard pin was was way lower than what I should have had it. Yeah. And then him moving in the uphill direction away from just that. Kind of set it up. For it, it just kind of set it up for it to go right through the brisket, man. But uh well, yeah, he'll be, he'll be dude, bigger next year. For sure. Um so day 2 in the books, um kind of a sad afternoon, evening. Uh yeah, it was back to camp. Um you know, we didn't even we didn't even hunt that evening. Um it was well we kind of packed out of there late we, we did we, yeah it, well, so we it was had a long, long drive it was a long haul long drive out of there yeah, yeah. we uh, sat water for a while but that's not us it was just yeah it was very uncomfortable oh, oh, no, that's when we, i got that big old cramp in my leg we did go check die. we did go check one other area um right there at sunset just to see if it had any action oh that's right um and it was bone dry yeah yeah there was it was void of elk there so um yeah back to camp dinner you know i got to cry all night and um weep and you know pout and suck my thumb and all that <laughs> <laughs> uh you know because dude that's elk hunting though because i'm thinking to, in my thought man i had an opportunity on day one now it's day two i had an opportunity i shot screwed it up and you know that's just normally not the way i do things you know whitetail hunting and all usually you know i can execute especially within that and i was just beat up and i was like that might be my opportunity man yeah. because elk hunting like that's that's just the way it goes in a 10-day span to be able to draw your bow on a bull you've you've had a successful hunt um you know and then going into day two uh we really didn't know what we were going to do our area That's going into day three. I now. mean, going into day three, we really didn't know what we were going to do. Um, we we went to an area that I that prospected, you know, the day before. Shot that bull, ruined that area. Um, you know, our area that we were camping in was uh, very few elk in that area, and felt like uh, there just wasn't mature bulls in there um, that we wanted to go go pursue. Uh, we just weren't seeing the numbers of elk sign that we wanted to see. Um, so yeah, we, we bombed. That yeah. Morning. And it was considerably hotter. Cause we, what we learned on day two is when we got, we got up in the Aspens, got up in that higher country a bit, temperature change was dramatic. It was a lot cooler. So, yeah. and there was more water and way better vegetation. So we knew that like day three, we're going back to a similar area that we we were familiar with yes so yes let's make a point of that because 
we basically mirrored or copied whatever we saw the day before and where the elk were wanting to hang out. Right. That's where we were going to end up yep. that afternoon. Yep. So we start in that morning with that exact plan in mind in hopes of maybe hearing or getting into something on our way to that because we had a pretty good hike ahead of us um, to get to duplicating the area we were in the day before. Yep. So I do my little sequence. <laughs> sure did. My little calf call, external cow call, and then it'll just a little bugle, just a little bugle. And, uh, dude, this was fun. Yeah, it was. We, so hiking in, we had, we, every ridge that we came up had a rub line on it. And we just so happened cross one of the, the freshest rub that I had believed to be made minutes before. And it just so happened we got a bugle on that ridge that had to have been that bull that made that rub. He responded to my little uh, sequence that I like to do. And he didn't really give a crap. He didn't really give a crap about it. We covered, I don't know, 150 yards to him, set up just to try to relocate him and he had moved just a little bit up that ridge away from us yeah, away from us right. knowing uh, knowing that he wasn't he wasn't trying to be aggressive or anything he wasn't he didn't really care about anything no um i think we ca did the same little sequence there he let us know where he was at um but the terrain and the vegetation didn't dictate us moving much closer to him because we were going to reveal our location and our us being people and uh him being able to see us from 400 yards away yeah 300 yards yeah, he away. was sorry moving right away yeah right away <laughs> so i i look back at you and i'm like hey man rattle those antlers dude start cracking some horns here let's get a little action going yeah and see what he thinks about that so we didn't even build up to it no we immediately went into crashing horns together yeah. and brush like there was there was two bulls thrashing over there is what it sounded like to me yeah and you proceeded to do some bull mews and raking and crashing of the antlers and i i mean crashing of the antlers yeah. like there was a there was a uh we had a good little tussle going on good little tussle going on yeah for something right right you didn't hear it amongst your rattling, but our bull, he piped off with just one of those, ooh, you know, like, oh, I'm coming. And, dude, from 300 yards away, I see this sucker coming through the woods, and behind him is this super blonde, what I thought to be a calf at the time, but then as he goes from 300 to 250, now to 200, he's closing the distance in a gallop, son. Like, this is full speed. This dude's covered. This dude's doing 40 miles an hour coming at us, okay? And in tow is this little mule deer buck, <laughs> a, a two-by-two two mule deer yeah. buck, bucking and kicking and him and fred the elk are coming in to see what this rattling is about dude yeah. and you can tell they're buddies well anyways this bull comes from 300 yards he closes into 100 to next thing you know he's 75 and he's coming straight to you and i'm positioned where he had originally bugled further to your right where now he is coming in on my left. On your left. Yeah. Hard left, 90 degrees to my left. Yeah. And he's he's 75 yards closing into you. He In your distance at this time, he's 60 yards, 50 yards, he's 40 yards. Yeah. I bark at him at 40 yards. He don't even care, dude. He's coming to you. And you're, you've shut up at this time because now you've seen him come and closing from the first time you see the bull is probably 75 yards away yep. when he rounds that big juniper. Yep. And he's coming hard. I bark at him to try to stop him whenever I've got him at a 50-yard shot. And he proceeds to go out to 60, 65. He comes into my lane. I bark at him then. 
and I assumed him to be, I think, about 75 yards because I'd, I'd ranged some other stuff there. I stopped him. He stopped perfect. I shot, and I mean, right over his back. Yeah, right over, man. I could hear that arrow coming. You could have you could have shot him frontal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I you could have shot him frontal. It he was, was interesting to see that little book. Well, not him. To see the scenario because – that little buck was it was hilarious to see him together i you couldn't know? believe it i'm like what I said, it, never... reminded, it reminded me of an old cartoon you know rocky and bullwinkle <laughs> yeah so you got you know it looked like a, he looked like a little squirrel running around with a moose i said that's and i was laughing the whole time because i'm thinking that's exactly what we look like out in the mountains <laughs> with little old me chasing you know my buddy over here the monster it was funny <laughs> it was hilarious but yeah it that shot hilarious. just that shot zipped over him and Man, we could never even find the arrow, but I could hear it coming. Yeah. And it never hit him. Just it zipped over his back. Something and- hit. Um, I don't know if his antlers hit a tree limb, but there was a puff of dust that came off of him. And um, the way he ducked and turned, it was very whitetail like. Yeah. Um, yeah, dude, it was just, it was a combination, I think, of him ducking the string and me holding too high over him. Yeah. Um, or anticipating his yardage, you know, at that distance, it's hard to tell 10 yards one way or the other. You know what I mean? Sure. It's one thing I can I can get a pretty good judge on out to 40, you know, maybe even 50. But then whenever you start stretching 60, 70, 80, it's, it, you know, it gets real. And he real... was out in the open, so it makes it even harder. You got no trees. Yeah, could, that, it, everything was way behind him. So Yeah, it, it gets real murky there at judging distance. Um you know, so thank God it was just a clean, clear miss. Um, and uh, I didn't really give a shit about it, actually. I laughed, and uh, I thought it was funny just because the whole situation. I'd never seen two species of, of male animals come running in together. And I'm talking side by side. These were buddies, dude. Yeah. You could tell they had been spending time together. <laughs> they knew each other. I wish we had video. Of I wish we did, too, yeah. man these guys they knew each other it was just so hilarious and to come and to have have a freaking mule deer come running into elk antlers and elk calls and all that he must he must just think he's an elk dude because he he it really feels like those two had spent the whole summer together just growing antler and eating and just being pals like oh, yeah. they were a oh. they were a bachelor group of their own he didn't realize he was a run of the litter he always <laughs> thought he was a leader of the pack man. yeah he's running so that's hilarious um so we listened to that bull uh he bugles at us a couple more times after that he didn't smell us Mm-mm. um he didn't he saw me but immediately after i blew that up by missing him i barked at him again um bugled and just tried to solidify to that bull that we were out um and he proceeds to climb a thousand foot up and over this ridge and uh so did we oh yeah (laughs) we followed him just like we always do and uh dude we went over the other side and we did rip some bugles and we did cow call and we did my sequence um with uh with no result Mm-mm, we had even taken a break we were eating something yep took a break ate a snack chilled um looked at the map tried to decipher what of all that looks like uh you know an elk bedding area to us based on what we saw the day before you know so we just you know really kind of planned on okay let's drop down the to the lower third of this or the upper third, the lower part of the upper third um, is where we kind of located a certain elevation, I guess you would say, the day before. And we were just going to start working that country, just doing what we do, covering country, go up to this ridge, bugle, cow call, do our sequence, whatever it may be. And then um, maybe set up a sequence here or there, do a scenario and uh, just do our thing, you know, move through the country and try to find water, try to find bedding just do it and uh i don't know why but i decided uh it was 11 11 30 11 15 11 15 yeah remember it hot very hot baking hot yeah <laughs> i really we do cooking. remember that yeah we were cooking and dude i started ripping on that calf call 
and lo and behold, a mile, mile and a half from us, we get a bull just begging us to come down. Yeah, he did. He was uh, definitely in his bed because he never moved location. Um, I think what we what we thought he was moving was wind direction. Yeah. Uh, blowing his bugle from one, or maybe him even casting yeah, he's the bugle. turning his head. Yeah, turning his head, bugling one way or the other. Um, to go down there, and I mean, we call ourselves in from um, a mile, mile and a half all the way into his bedding area, man. And we sit there on top of that bull. You know, we went in there with questionable wind to begin with because it kept puffing in the right directions. And then we were kind of ignoring when it puffed into the wrong directions. <laughs> um, that's just me being aggressive. Um, hoping that it puffed longer in the good directions than it did the bad. Um, and I just don't think it, you know, I think it kind of, you know, it blew us up. Yeah, it bit us in the butt. It bit us in the butt, yeah. Um, but remember, later on, we've come to find out that there was a water source that he was staying by that we didn't know was there. That's correct. So, so he probably, either he smelt us or he went to water. Because we waited him out. We waited for two hours there. Yeah, we waited until it was about 1, 1.30 yeah. before we pursued into his area. But still, even when we did pursue, we just didn't, we never had wind right. It just yeah. wasn't helping yeah. us at all. Yeah, so wind was not our friend yep so we licked our wounds there of that failed attempt i mean we got right up in his grill and we were right there within killing distance we just needed um we needed him to not we needed him to get out of his bed and pursue us um you know and it just it wasn't working that way because he was kind of already committed to being in his area yeah. and we weren't presenting anything super necessary we were covering ground. This is the way I was thinking of it. We were covering ground as a calf just fine. I mean, we went a whole mile. The least we could have done was gone another 150 yards yep. is the way I think he would have been thinking about it. Big old bull like that. Because the way he was responding was, it, it was a mature bull. Yeah, it was a good bull. It was a good bull. And he he knew we were capable of coming to him. And when we weren't, he just didn't give a shit. He you know, just basically wrote us off and was like, well, you can either come over to me or not. Yeah. I'm staying He had here. that one lazy bed bugle, and he could tell he's just, he ain't getting up. Yeah. I um, mean, we could have maybe tried a, a slow play on him at some point, but we just hadn't been using that scenario on the way we've been calling to him. You know, that would have been a whole different thing. We uh, quite have been possible, but. Yeah. Anyway, just wasn't that that's not who we were supposed to have that day. <laughs> so So we, you know, uh doing what we do, we, we knew a failed attempt and we bailed out of that area and made our way back up <laughs> up and over. Up and over. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And dude, at any time when you feel like you're you're well-being is at risk you just need to tell me dude and i'm willing to hike around and go do something else no it was hilarious because we get to that piece where you're standing on i'm looking down i'm like well where the heck am i going to climb off this thing because i can't we're cliffed out yeah y'all don't know we yeah. so from where that from where we left that bull we climbed back up the ridge yeah. another couple hundred feet elevation up and over and get we get to the you know the pinnacle of the ridge um and it's time to go uh, back down and work through the country that we had saved for the evening hunt and it is friggin gnarly i mean we're standing on top of a 10 foot bluff on top of a 30 foot you know that has a four foot ledge five foot ledge and then a 10 and then a 30 foot bluff that has a little scree you know grass dirt mud uh leaf matter tucked up into deadfall you know alleyway to get to get our manage our way down these cliffs yeah. before we get into benches that we can feel safe and uh well we ended up finding that spot right on the right there was that tree and there was a little because my legs were long enough right there i'm like oh yeah i can slide down this no problem but it was the next piece yeah it was even bigger and i thought man yeah it was bigger. we're gonna get off of this thing you know yeah. but and it's ate up with brush and stuff so if you fell you're only gonna break an arm and then yeah, and all. then the trees and bushes yeah. are gonna catch you from falling the other <laughs> 
the other hundred something foot. Um, but <laughs> I just went down on my butt in that section just to make sure I didn't. I was just worried, like if I step wrong, I'm gonna go head over heels. Yeah, I wasn't worried about. It. I was like, okay, just be smart here, dude. Sit down. Yep. Just slide down your. And butt. I've done that before, dude. I've stepped on a stick with my leading foot, and, dude. and then it picks it up on the back, and then my front toe catches that and i'm on top of the stick with one leg and it's tripping me up on the other and then there i go head over heels yeah, you're dude tumble i've done it before yeah. matter of fact on this mountain that we're back here behind you um i've done that and i'm talking i bent the shit out of my side housing um i had to go back to camp hammer it back straight recite my bow in and everything so it, it is smart to uh you know just navigate that stuff you know with a clear head. I mean, if you're, if you, if you don't think you can manage it, then don't, Yeah. you know, the good thing was, is I knew there was, there was sliding opportunity there. Um, and sliding is way better than falling. Um, you know, you can manage a slide pretty good if you, you know, know what you're doing. Yeah. You can kind of sit on one boot even and put one leg out in front of you. Uh, and, and you sit as a break. Yeah. Just... Use, use your foot as a break. And, um, yeah. So we managed our way down through there. Um, you know, we worked the country like we normally would. We did a couple setups in areas that were just loaded with sign. Yeah. I mean, it was bull bedding, bachelor area, bachelor pad looking to me like more so than we've seen anywhere. Yep. Um, but just very void of elk. There was just, there we wasn't, just weren't there, weren't there. Um, so it's early. I'm, I'm tuck my tail, uh, I'm at this point, I'm ready to go back to camp and make dinner. We still have an hour and a half. Uh, I mean, we still have an hour of hiking to get back to the, uh, the Jeep. Um, the plan was, was to just hike the rest of the way out of the country and then go maybe have an early, early dinner, um, watch the sunset from camp. And, uh, and you know, we run into a couple of cows on our way back calves. They were calves. Um, we called them in. I decided I I, I just wasn't going to shoot a calf, man. Yeah. You know they were they were only three hundred pounders. And right. We were hoping there was a bull somewhere in that vicinity with them. Yeah. We just hadn't seen him. Yeah, yet. we were. So we proceeded to call at them and had great little fun with them. Um, had them bark back and forth and call them back, and it was fun. Um, you know, I anytime you get a chance to work your magic on real elk, it just builds that confidence, dude. Yeah. You know, so I think it was great. And you get to see what they're doing, how they're responding. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, I definitely could have popped one of them, but, uh, you know, I want a full-size elk. Um, so, yeah, dude, we jump in the rig. We jump in the J-Wagon, make our hike back. You know, at this point, it's probably an hour and a half, maybe an hour before sunset. Yeah, about an hour. Probably about an hour. Um and we're bombing, dude. We're headed back to camp. We're going to make dinner. Yeah, we're hoping to get to camp by dark. Yeah. And then uh, I see this road. I, <laughs> I see this road I had been looking at. I had actually been looking for this road a couple days before, but I had passed it. And once I pass something, I don't, I'm like, eh, pff, you know, whatever. It was meant to be. But today I didn't pass it. No, he didn't. He locked up the wheels. Did a Chicano rewind, bro. We hit reverse, and <laughs> my boy hung a left. Yep. I was like, I want to go over here and take a look at this lake. It's over here on some private property, um, and this little road goes right through the corner of that private property. Um, it's a Forest Service road, so we're legal to be there, um, and this was actually this this particular private property where we were actually legal to hunt it. Um, but I just wanted to go check out the water situation over there because in this unit in New Mexico, it's water is very dependent on where the elk are going to be, Yep. you know? So, um, I wanted to go inspect it and see what we saw. We drove past the water level was pretty low. Um, I did, we didn't even get out and check the water. Didn't even, we just, I was, I was in drive mode, honestly. Yeah. And we bebop up the trail, probably, I don't know, another half a mile from that lake. And, uh, I don't know what it was, dude. I just got this feeling. I was like, man, I'm going to pop a bugle out right here. So we shut the car off, open up the doors, and I just stood up out of the car. You know, didn't even, I mean, it was seconds after, set, you know, turning the car off. And I just ripped this beautiful little mild location bugle. And out of the, I mean, 400 yards from us, this bull just tells us, to get out of his area yeah a noise i've never heard a bull make i i don't know what 
this was. It was like a, a bark growl. That's exactly how I would describe that. You know, it was like a brr. Yeah, you could just tell from that. It's like, ooh, he doesn't like us. He being did here. not like we're us in, being we're there. We're in his spot. Ooh, now it's time. So we immediately, I grab my bow. No, I don't have any. I grabbed my bino harness on, so I had my rangefinder and my bow. I didn't even have my phone, nothing. We burned, we just beelined straight to the bull. And it's a dynamic setup, this is the way I, I would say it. We, every time I move forward, you move forward. We we were back there. You make a call to him. Yeah, I, I, I think him. I told you to bugle. I bugled at him because I wanted to verify his, yeah. his direction again. He had moved to the right a little. He was going to water. Yeah. So we moved in on him even closer. I mean, we moved a good hundred yards, and we were closing distance fast. Yep. And I mean, dude, you were letting him have it, bro. Yeah. Yep. D- describe yep. to describe to the folks like what you were hearing and then what you were responding with. Um, and just, I, I'll walk through the, you know, I'll just kind of fill in on where I was from yeah, there. So once you and I, engage- your calling was spot on. Well, dude. you engaged him, but just his response and given the time it was late, we knew, okay, this guy's ready to play. This is not, uh, this is not a little case. It's not letting, there's nothing. This is a slow play. No, there's no slow play. This guy is not, He's defensive right off the bat. He yes. does not like us being in his – this is his lair. This is where he wants to be. Stay away. Yep. So we're approaching him. From your first sound of your first call, we had already cut distance. By a couple hundred yeah. yards. So I rip a bugle at him. I'm, I'm close enough I'm close enough to where I can see the bull. Yeah. And and he's 100 yards from me at this point. Yep. So I'm, I'm hitting him, and uh, he's not. he's just responding right away. So I just start getting nasty. You know, I just really start just screaming at him, letting him know, like, hey, I'm not going nowhere. And not chuckling. You were no, grunting. I was grunting at him hard, just letting him know, like, okay, you th- you think this is your spot? Well, I'm here. Come get some. I'm yes. not going nowhere. So from that point, raking. I just pull out the horn, start raking trees, ripping, and then I'm just screaming bugles at him. Yeah. Just And he's just going nuts. And I'm trying to get him to come in there. And then I actually, then I've, he, I could tell he's not, he's hadn't fully committed yet. He wanted to sit over there and rake yeah. and duplicate what you were doing. Yep. He, exactly. Because you were showing dominance by raking, so he, he wanted to show thing. dominance. Yeah. He didn't necessarily, wasn't committed to engage no. at that point. No. No. I, so when I knew that that was it, I said, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to introduce a cow to him. So I started, and I wasn't directly, I didn't introduce the cow directly to him. I played the scenario. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But I, I introduced this cow, and then I, I'm, I, then I start playing my bull scenario, and I start getting hot for this cow. And then he just lights up. And then when he starts at, so then I, I, I call at him. I, I did like a little regather mute, letting him know like, oh, yeah, I'm over here. That contact yeah, buzz. Yeah, contact buzz. Come on over here. Yeah. Come on over here. And he's getting – so when he starts lighting he up – He hammered that one time oh, after he, that. Yeah, he goes and, hard. And then I just – I I I growled at him like, stay back. And then I just scream at him. Yeah. And then I'm just – man, I'm going hard. I'm grunting. And, and man, that's it. That was it. The last thing I had to do, and I didn't have to, was I was going to bark, scream at him. Yeah. But – I, I was watching you the whole time, and then yeah. from that point, I was like, "Okay, he's he's getting ready to engage this bull. He's getting yeah. he's coming to the shooting distance." Well, he went from being you know a hundred, he came into fifty five and was raking there for the longest time, and then you introduced the cow, and then he ripped that bugle, and then he committed to come in, and it was going to be a fight. Like he was coming to fight you. Yeah. And dude, this guy, I I knew where I wanted him to be. And I knew what trees were my distances. I had 30 marked out. I had 20. I had all this. And uh, when he committed, I knew when he came from 55, he was just coming in and it was coming in hard. When he got to my 30, I drew so I could stop him because he was coming frontal. And I, I was hoping to spook him a little bit so that he would jump sideways and go broadside. But he didn't. He never noticed me there. He came to, I drew at 30. He comes in 25, 20, 
18, 15, 14, 13, dude. And at this point, when he's at 16, 15, something like that, my side housing is all hair, and I can't tell what part of the elk I've got my side on, dude, because he's that close. And so I get out of my sight, and it, I'm like, okay, I'm right on him. You know, I get back into my into my peep to make sure I'm yeah. anchored and everything, and I pull it right. I mean, I put it right on that crease. I can see him. You know, I can see that little crease right where he when he's walking. And at this point, dude, it's pretty much frontal, frontal, frontal. And then at the last second, at 8 to 12 yards, he turns to go around a tree, which is what I was standing, which is what I was uh, um, I was in front of. Yeah. So he was turning to go around me, kind of. There was another little tree to my right, a couple of small ones. So he was going to go around this group, thank God. And I just tucked it right in behind his shoulder, man and let it rip and when the bow went off he jumped out there about 20 feet and then proceeded to kind of trot off to about 50 yards i thought i missed him again i thought i'd done screwed up and shot him under his belly or something stupid like i did the day before yeah. um, whenever i shot the bull in the brisket and uh he stands out there and it, it, we both bark and bugle at him so he stops locks up and turns and looks at me and I'm I'm in my binos now, and I'm not seeing nothing, dude. His offside shot was facing me. Well, little did I know, I I I absolutely smoked him. Hammered him right behind the shoulder, quarter and hard. It it hit him right, right before I could hit bone in the shoulder, and then exited right before his hip in in the guts, um, on the offside. And that's why I wasn't seeing blood is because immediately his guts just plugged the hole on that one side. Well, dude, then he just starts slowly walking back where he had come from. And he walks over and I'm at this time, I'm, I'm trying to get my arrow situated. I actually had another arrow on already because I was ready to poke him out, out at 55 or whatever he was. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I thought I missed him and yeah. I, I was getting, I didn't want to call to him again because I knew that was going to blow up the situation. You were already back there kind of still cow calling and, and trying to keep him, keep yeah. his, you know, his, uh, keep his it. interest. And yep. I heard the shot. I heard you hit him. Yeah. I could hear that. F I, I didn't I think I hit him. I thump through him, but when I'm watching you take off, load another arrow, I said, okay, he's trying to put another arrow in him. I don't know where you shot him. I couldn't tell. I could see the animal. But then I lost him as he went up. Yeah. And I, but I'm watching you. I'm okay. Well, I gotta stay. He, I'm, I keep calling. I keep calling, and I'm just kind of watching you. And then I seen you draw again. I thought, okay, he's gonna get another shot. Yeah. That shot, I didn't hear you. Yeah. Well, so what happened is, is he left from that 55, and he walks diagonal, you know, from my right to left, and fades back right over back towards the tree that he was originally raking. And um, he's going 55, 60. He's out there now to 94 yards. But where he, where I, I noticed he had really slowed down his pace because from 55 yards to about 70 yards, he had a little pep in his step. Like he, he was just trotting away like nothing had ever happened to him. And then his trot went to a walk, to a slow walk, to just him sitting there and he started to sway a little bit and then he hangs his head way low man and he's wiggling that ear and i knew he wasn't doing good then i knew that i'd hit him so then i immediately pop my shoes off i get in i at that point i was at 94 yards from him and i creep in 30 yards and from that point he's really starting to sway i'm just locked on to him to make sure that if he lift, if he lifts his head at all noticing me coming up then i know i need to stop and, and take a shot but i'm trying to cover distance and get as close as i can because apparently i suck at shooting <laughs> so <laughs> i wanted to make sure that my shitty shot was going to make it to him and dude he crashes into my shooting lane at, at the time, I was at 64 yards, and as soon as he crashed, I ranged him, dialed my pin, went back, you know, drew back, anchored, settled the pin, and I, I absolutely smoked him again. Yeah, hit him in the upper lungs. Hit him in the upper lungs, and it sounded like he was holding his breath, and whenever I hit him, it let all of the air out of him. I mean, it just, that's the, that's the noise that it made. 
and he expired immediately if he wasn't dead already by um you know just him i think that was part of him locking up um but yeah dude an absolute toad of a bull i mean just i couldn't have uh i couldn't have dreamt of a better bull you know yeah, he's i mean a bull you know going in with i always go in with low expectations now I never go in with expectations of even having ex- an expectation of killing an elk um, because every time I do that, I always get humbled. And I just I just know now that it's about the adventure of the hunt that is the success rather than filling the tag. I know that. Um, so my expectation of a successful hunt is just going and being out here with somebody like you and spending the time in nature and the icing on the cake is that bull. Um, but dude, when we walked up on him, yeah, dude, we were ecstatic. When I saw you throw your arms in the air, Unreal. I was coming to you. I'm like, Oh yeah, dude, I was oh, running, got it done, man. running got back at done. you do with my bow yeah. overhead, yeah. you know, just fist pumping. Um, and I knew it was a good bull. I had no, I, I just didn't know how big he was going to be. I was like, cause yeah. just, you know, that, that battle him and I were having, and then to bring him into you is what, you know, I always wanted to do anyway. Yeah. It's like, man, I want to call. It was, I mean, it, when, if you dream up a scenario of, yeah. you know, that's the fantasy uh, yeah. right there. Yeah. That, what, what we went through right there is the fantasy of what all these guys coming out here to do just, they that's what they are hoping to have you know yeah and to have it go down like that dude and with you there and the struggles we had the year before dude it was just it was just so epic and and the most i mean it was just you couldn't you couldn't have wrote a script better than that you know and we talked about it the whole time like we know something's going to be epic we don't know what it's going to be yeah we just well, trust our, every day. That's you know, take the day as it comes and find some learnings through it, and then yeah, we like, don't know how it's going to happen. We think you, you you think about your hunts and how you want things to go down, but reality is it's never like that. It just never. It always happens a different way, but that's the fun of it too. Not yeah. wrong about dreaming how you want it to go down, but man, for sure, when it does, well, that keeps you driving. Yeah, it keeps, it keeps that you driving there. For sure. Um, but you know, to have it go down one day like you dream, yeah. you know, like whenever a first time elk hunter comes out, he's dreaming of that. Yeah. You know, and to go through that struggle and it never goes down like that. Yeah. You know, to have it go down with us like that was freaking epic. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't a lot of time. It just happened. It, that, it was that, less, was the, that was the beauty of it. That's, it was. Those are the rare ones. We had 20 minutes before sunset, and we made from the first bugle to the bull laying on the ground, my second shot, it was in 10 minutes. Yeah, it was done. And yeah. the other battle that you and I were fighting through that was we were in a patch of mosquitoes. Oh, God. And so... They are just tearing me up, man. I've never wanted to horrible. smack myself in the face <laughs> yeah. so bad, dude. Yeah. I guarantee you at one time, on the downwind side, they were hovering around my ear. So all I could hear was, <laughs> yes, all of that, and then you bugling and the bull raking. Yeah. And that's all I could hear, dude. I honestly thought I was zoning out because, yeah. you know, like sometimes whenever your ears just ring, yeah. I was like, oh, here we go. I'm just going to black out or something. Yeah. No. It was worse for you than me because you were in a spot where he could see and not move. Yeah. I'm back there. I'm swatting. I got horns flying. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, just go away, go away. Like, let me work this bull, you know? Yeah. Guys, uh, the mosquitoes dude, were going to be the death of me. They were thick. Yeah, they were. And the reason why, dude, is because yeah. it was lush as could be over yeah. there. Yeah. Those uh, those elk were in there. We learned the next day by the hunters. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, man, it was absolutely epic to be able to to, to pull over on in the car and bugle and then tromp right up and smoke a bull and then drive the car right up to the bull and i i did i, I carried meat literally 30 feet and put it in the back of a ranger yep it was right there and then to have the help that we had man yeah. just made it the easiest yeah haul out it could have been yeah yeah i want to thank zuni mountain outfitters um andreas campos his wife tony 
Big Tony comes out and helps, you know. Uh, definitely they did not have to do that, you know. That's just the good people that they are. And I even, you know, I told Tony I thanked him the next day, and he's like, hey, man, that's what brothers do, you know. And that's that's the mindset of the people that I like to surround myself yeah. with, dude, because yeah. such great people. If any of you guys are new to this and you want to have – this experience don't go try to do it by yourself man don't go get disappointed and don't go get humbled at least spend that money that you would be spending on gear and all this these courses and all this knowledge and you know all the things you need to have to go get it done solo spend it on an outfitter dude would you not agree with that yeah, it's a great way to start, man. Get your feet wet to learn. Yeah, it's get your feet deal. wet. Or or find somebody you know that's willing, that really has a desire to help people elk hunt. Yeah. Like you or myself. Right. We get a lot of joy at taking somebody that hasn't. But, dude, had, like but some dude rare. from, like, Virginia or North Carolina or something like yeah. that, don't have this be a once-in-a-lifetime deal and, you know, cough up a little bit of money a little bit more money and have that knowledge base of your yeah. of a guide and an outfitter to be able to put you on animals in those areas because you're going to spend so many days looking for those animals and then planning on an opportunity yeah. or building a a plan to get an opportunity when the outfitter has been there probably his whole life and he knows the unit with the back of his hand and he can just put you on animals a lot quicker and and cut that learning curve because then you can be asking somebody with that knowledge and you know zuni zuni mountain uh god and outfitters is i mean they're just great people they have great accommodations this isn't this isn't your five star now you know this is the middle of the road you know this is obtainable for for everyday folks yep you know, don't expect to come in and there'd be this giant lodge that has marble countertops. And uh, that's not what this is. This is this is enough to get you by, to keep you comfortable, uh, a warm place to sleep, hot meals, and then, and then you're hunting. You yeah. know what I mean? Or if you want to do that backcountry, uh, you know, stay in a wall tent and and. Um, have food prepared for you out there and you you guys hunt out of a wall tent every day that's available too yeah. so you just have to explain to andreas what you want and he can probably put it together for you for sure um, even if it is that five star you know that might be an accommodation that he can acquire yeah um, or if that's not the route you want to go and you're more like hey I'm, you know well like I'm, I'm committed to it more like I want to see if this is my first experience. There's somebody, hey, you know, I've had a little bit. I've done something, but I, I just need to build my knowledge base. I want it to feel like I'm, I'm in the hunt. I'm doing it. Then you've got the Elk Bros Adventure style, where it's more of a coaching piece. They're going to take you through True. everything, but we're the experience is not that they're going to do the work. They're not guiding you. Right. It's going to be your hunt, but they're going to be alongside you, helping to. It's a coachable experience. They're teaching you how to fish, yeah. so you can learn that. You know, yeah, that you're not feeding a man. Yeah, you know, you're not feeding a, a man, giving a man a fish for a day. You're, you're teaching him how to fish so he can do it for life. There's other that's ways, right. and that's kind of the style the Elk Bros use, which works too. But man, I dress those guys over there. They're just so always helpful. He's always just, you know, he gives us run of the place, which is amazing. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, the next day, you and I actually got to go. Uh, that evening and kind of return the favor, go help them yeah. with, with uh, just a freak bull. Yeah. He's just. I will put a picture of this bull yeah. um, on my Instagram. I, uh, I actually already have. If you guys don't follow me on Instagram, I'm Cole Wilkes Hunter. Um, the podcast you should also follow on Instagram because uh, we make different posts and you can kind of see who we're talking to our guests and um, we'll post some pictures and stuff up of that. But I'll definitely be making a post on um, on the In the Bush podcast um, Instagram page um, of my bull and I'll also put uh, put this bull that we help recover. But um, yeah, man, just some very very quality high quality animals over here. Um, in uh you know in new mexico so he can help you out even if you draw a tag um you know he could uh he can hook you up with a guide in your unit um i believe uh that's that's something that they can do as well so 
uh, New Mexico wide. If you guys need help in any way, shape, or form, you have the Elk Bros Adventure Camp. If you want to learn to just do it DIY, only do it yourself, have a coach there with you to uh, to kind of coach you through that process and get out there and get it, you know, get it done on your own or come fully guided, fully outfitted um, with Andreas here in, uh, in New Mexico. And, uh, yeah, those are the best options I think you can have, man. And uh, I'm very, very lucky uh, to be able to have the opportunity and, and have, you know, Andreas give me that, uh, that opportunity to kind of have – to be self-guided and let me do my thing. My yep. thing. And, uh, man, it's just so cool. And, Andreas, if you are, are listening to this, you should draw an archery tag – again and uh me and uh, me and eric want to return the favor and call you in a bowl yes we do so well y'all this has been a great episode i think dude we've been going for almost two hours have we really <laughs> oh we don't, that figures we don't know how to be quiet when it comes to hunting elk yeah so. um dude thank you so much for being there with me on that hunt you followed me now for two seasons dude with just you spent your own money getting there, dude. I just, I, and I do have something for you. Uh, and, give me nothing. Oh, no. Bro. It's just yeah. an experience. Is all I do. need. That's Gotta not how it My works. brother with my another mother. But uh, I, I'm hoping to return the favor here in Colorado. It was close yesterday. Yeah, it was. Um, we still have uh, 12 or 14 days. I don't know how many more days we got left, but um, I, I'm confident we're going to get at least a bull down. Yeah, we got a, we got a few days to get it done and. Yeah. You know, create some opportunities what we need to do yeah yeah just create we will. opportunities capitalize on that and see if i can put an animal down and again i'm i'm an equal opportunity hunter i'll i'll take a cow or, or a bull you know whatever's yeah. legal here i'm just as happy i just want to have some meat in my freezer for the next year yeah man i don't know what it is but i'm not very good at calling in cows dude well that's even better I'll yeah. just go ahead and take <laughs> we'll see with this calf uh, piece you might be calling in some yeah it might yeah. but Every response fat. I've ever had with that has always been a bull. Yeah. You yeah. know that? No, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah, man. The next adventure. You guys, thank you so much for listening. Make sure you subscribe and rate us. We would so appreciate a five-star rating. Um, and leave us a message on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, you guys can leave us a leave us messages on the episode on Spotify. So if you just scroll down, you can see the comment section, or go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review, and leave us your name and number because I'd love to give you guys a shout out. Um, yeah, we so much appreciate you, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, we're, happy hunting, man. We'll see you all in the next ridge. Yep, we're gonna be out here in the bush hunting some elk. A que te mayanda, a me a sanza tina. Cuatanita, si, cuatapema, ukuama ukuaishi.